Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Texas Rangers franchise here on MLB The Show 21 and the MSM Sports Network. We begin today's episode with a mea culpa, a rather large one too. I have to let you know that last episode's draft video uh, is not entirely correct. When I got back to MLB The Show today, so two days after I originally recorded the draft video, for whatever reason, my draft file had not saved. I don't know if the file didn't go through, or if something got corrupted, or maybe I just forgot to save it in the first place. I've had a ton going on, and I've been uh, really stretching myself thin, trying to put out as many videos as I can, so it very well could be user error, but... Uh, essentially the draft that we did last time was deleted it didn't save to my console so what I did was I went through it again and ensured that I got all six original draft picks all six of these guys this is the second time around that I've drafted I'm recording this live essentially this intro uh, because I wanted you to, to rest assured that everything that I could do to make sure things were the same happened we took Hank Lyons over uh, the first overall and, and so on and so forth. I didn't change a single thing despite knowing, obviously, everyone's ratings. What did change was uh, some of the other draft picks and where they went. So first I'll show you the division and then I'll show you where a couple of other important pieces went. The Mariners got Aaron Blount. I think he went to the Twins in the last episode. Really good closing pitcher, but I don't really worry about relievers in this game. Ryan Carrington goes to the Oakland A's. I can't remember if they took him originally or not. The Angels did not get their original starting pitcher, but they got another very good one. They got Avery Perez, who's going to throw breaking balls all day long. He'll be fun to play against uh, down the line. And then the Astros took Alvar uh, Alvaro Espinosa. Uh, they also took Junior Urban, who they took in the original draft video. So good to see that some things remained the same. You look across the rest of the league, and Scott Juarez goes to the Kansas City Royals. He was the guy that originally went to the Angels. Clyde Jansen originally went to the Royals. He's now with the Tigers, and so on and so forth. Little moves like that happened across the league, and I'll point out the big ones as we get there. Guys like William Wolf, though, some of them ended up on their exact same teams, which was nice to see. Now, maybe the biggest one, there's actually the two big discrepancies that I'll get to. The first of which is that Dan Porton, the catcher from Texas Tech, did not go to the Baltimore Orioles in this one. Uh, he went to the San Francisco Giants, and instead the Orioles got Shane Bouchard as their over, uh, number one overall pick. I think this is a better fit for the Orioles anyway. They didn't need a catcher, and so I'm glad to see that they took actually a quality starting pitcher that hopefully we'll see down the line. Now, the Giants did take Dan Porton, and I understand at some point you have to say you take the best player available. But I was thinking about this off camera. I think going after Dan Porton in a trade next season might be a relatively realistic move that we could accomplish. He's only 63 overall, so he's a very young uh, catcher skill-wise, and he's 21 years old. There's absolutely no guarantee that he ever reaches that potential, and I think that's what the beauty of this year's game is, is the developers has, have said that the scouting and the drafting this year is more projection-based than it ever has. In the past, there were certain players that relatively were locks to develop into whatever their potential was. That's changed this year, and so I think going after a guy like Dan Porton, who obviously has a high ceiling, uh, but isn't necessarily needed by the team that drafted him. They've got Buster Posey right now, and they have Joey Bart coming up behind him. They don't necessarily need another stud catcher, so for those of you that are going to be mad that I didn't take Dan Porton, well, we may go after him and get him in next season. Uh, continuing on, the Dodgers had a horrific draft, and this was the other main change. Morris Cash, instead of going to the Milwaukee Brewers, he goes to the Colorado Rockies. I think he's going to be a phenomenal pitcher. I think he's the future ace of the Colorado Rockies, and I certainly don't plan on trading for him because I think he's going to be a bona fide stud. Guys like Sean Camerata did end up with their original team. Richard Kwan, who is the highest overall rated player as far as potential goes, he still ends up with the St. Louis Cardinals. So in the end, 
a lot of guys stayed in their same organizations. Some of them changed. The number one overall draft pick was actually Eddie uh, Manzanillo, starting pitcher out of high school that goes to the Pirates. I like that pick for them as well, a lot more than I do uh, William Chin, who went to the uh, Miami Marlins. So all of this to say, I'm so sorry about the, the discrepancy and the lack of saving the file on my part. Whatever happened, I do apologize for that. But at the very least, I did ensure that all six of our guys are the same, and now we can move on in the franchise. And not only do we have the same six guys, but you also know where the big guys landed as well. So with the bad news out of the way, let's get to some good news. That being that the Colorado Rockies were interested in trading with us. They wanted Shane Green to add to their bullpen, and it's hard to fault them. Shane has had a very solid season. He's been struggling as of late. That ERA was formerly under half a run. It's now a little up over three, but still, Green has shown the ability to pitch well and pitch in competitive games and uh, that's drawn a lot of attention from around the league. So much so that Colorado was willing to part with Colton Welker. They drafted him four years ago out of high school in the state of Florida, and even though he's only 10 games in, Welker's hitting 300, a home run, and eight RBIs. He's also worked five walks. Now, initially, I wasn't sold on this idea because we have so many third basemen in the organization, but I went and actually researched Welker, and he's hit very well throughout his minor league career. I think the stats bear that out, his ratings, that is. He's a very solid hitter and can hit for some power uh, depending on who he's facing. Uh, obviously, a little bit better against lefties. He's not a natural fielder, that fielding just above 50, uh, and his arm's not the strongest either. So I'm not necessarily convinced that he plays at third base for his career, but I think he could certainly be a serviceable corner infielder and also play some second. Doesn't hurt that he has 68 speed, so he's not terribly slow. And at the end of the day, Shane Green, a 32-year-old relief pitcher, I decided to go ahead and accept this trade. I didn't want to reject it, try and make it happen later, and have the Rockies not be interested in it anymore. In the case that this was a one-time offer, I accepted that trade, and Colton Welker joined the Texas Rangers. With the open roster spot, we called Kyle Cody back up to the majors. He was 1-1 one and one in just over 12 innings pitched with a 5.25 ERA in his previous outings at the big league level, and I like Cody. I think there's a lot developing with him. I want to get to see what he does through the remainder of this season. Uh, you see right here, I'm kind of reorganizing the catchers in the organization. We sent Jonah Heim back down. He had just not been hitting the baseball well, and with Sam Huff performing offensively, uh, it was just a natural move to go ahead and keep him at the big league level while uh, demoting Heim. Here you get to look at the trades that have happened this season, and none major. It's mostly a lot of prospects swapping, although Franmil Reyes did get moved from the Indians to the Oakland A's. You're actually going to see him later in this episode. And then the Yankees traded Jordan Montgomery for center fielder Victor Robles. I don't really know who won that trade. The Nationals, as you'll see next episode, really need pitching, and they're going for it. Uh, they want to make another postseason run, and so I guess they decided to move on from Robles and pick up uh, Montgomery, who's a very good starter. Speaking of starting pitching, Cole Hamels was the object of a trade proposal. The San Francisco Giants are in great position in the NL West. They're in a wild card spot and they wanted starting pitching. So we put together a trade here and I was looking through my options. Our package would include Cole Hamels, Brock Holt, and center field prospect Bubba Thompson. And in response, we're gonna get outfielder Alexander Can Canonario and Gregory Santos. As you get a look at both of their stats, I like this trade for us. I think they're both uh, going to be good prospects and a lot of development coming up in the future. Uh, to replace Hamels in the starting rotation, we called Colby Allard back up. He's been a relief pitcher in the organization for the last year and change, but I really thought that it was his time to come up and get a chance to start, as well as the man on your screen right now, Josh Young. 
We're going to call up the former Texas Tech Red Raider, and he's about to make his major league debut as you look at his stats right there. Young has been hitting very well at the AA level, and with the team in need of some help, I thought it was a good time to call Josh Young up. He'll get the next two starts in these first two games against the Oakland A's. You see there, it'll be Colby Allard starting in the second one. We'll player lock Josh Young here in the first, and his uh, first assignment was against Sean Manaya, one of the toughest pitchers in the American League to face. This was not going to be an easy task, and in Josh's first ever plate appearance, uh, he gets the chance to hit against uh, the Oakland A's ace, and it would be a battle for him. One, two count here in this first at bat, and Young is going to ground this over to first base. Fortunately for Texas, Olsen misplays it, and it's not an inning-ending double play, but not the hit that Young was looking for to start his big league debut. Take you to the eighth inning now, and it's another ground ball for Josh Young. He just had a hard time hitting Manaya. I believe he struck out earlier in this game as well. He goes 0 for 4 in his debut, but in baseball, there is always another chance the next day. And we put Young back into the starting lineup. He'd be hitting in the 7 spot for Texas and uh, would get a chance here against Chris Bassett, a much different pitcher, obviously a right-handed pitcher, uh, but Josh Young on the very first pitch that he sees here in his second MLB game, right back up the middle for his first career Major League Baseball hit. That ball will obviously be tossed back in as Young pays off a lifetime of hard work, and he knows that he's got high expectations. A lot of Ranger hopes and dreams are riding on his shoulders, and the first base hit a great opening step in his career. The uh, very next batter was uh, Anderson Tejada, and Tejada is going to knock Young in here. So Young gets his first career hit. He's also going to score his first career run as Anderson Tejada bounces that one off the right field wall. Texas would take the lead 1-0 in the second. Show you Colby Allard as he gets his first start of 2021, and uh, this is also the first fielding opportunity for Josh Young as he collects that, easily makes the play. Colby was very, very good in this start and got some good defensive plays from guys like Young right behind him. To the top of the fourth now, and it's a runner on first and uh, nobody out for Josh Young once again. He takes a high cutter that just missed the zone, a good take from Young, and he'll pay it off here on the 2-2 pitch as Bassett leaves another fastball right down the middle, and this time it's perfect, perfect contact for Josh Young. Such a compact swing, but he's also got some good power. I think Young is going to be a natural hitter in this lineup, hopefully for years to come. Top of the eighth now, two runners on, and this is against Jake Diekman. I don't know how Diekman got this fastball in on the hands. I was sitting on a fastball the entire time, and somehow that ball still snuck in. But Young doesn't ground into the double play, and as a result, it's Delino DeShields who's going to pay it off. A two-RBI single as the Rangers take a 4-3 lead, the former Texas Ranger and Jake Diekman blows the save, and the Rangers had runners on as uh, another runner would get on base here in the top of the ninth. Joey Gallo, once again, he's turning his season around. Hasn't been great, but certainly is on the comeback trail in a 0-1 pitch. Joey Gallo goes deep. This ball, a no-doubter into the seats and right. Texas would extend their lead and get the insurance that they needed. It was 6-3 to three as Gallo hits his 18th home run of the season off Cam Bedrosian. A, another step for Gallo as he continues to build back his confidence and make a push towards possible all-star considerations. He celebrates that with Sam Huff who had just gotten on with a double of his own. Take you to the bottom of the ninth now. Runner on first, but Brett Martin's going to erase that. A little 4-6-3 double play. The A's lose their base runner in the ninth inning, and uh, with just one out, it was up to Fran Mel Reyes, who was a tough at bat. He certainly gave Martin uh, a run for his money, but in the end, he lines it down to first. A good play by Nate Lowe, and the Texas Rangers would take that game over the Oakland A's by the final score of 6-3. to three. Ian Kennedy gets the win, as you see uh, Kiner Falefa and Tejada celebrate. Possible pairing up the middle for the next couple of seasons. Well, we got out of that game, and I was looking to upgrade our bullpen potential, 
and I found Burl Caraway, who I actually covered at Dallas Baptist University last season. He was drafted in the second round by the Cubs, and we would end up trading for Burl Caraway as Ian Kennedy was a part of that package that went over for uh, for Burl. Burl's very, very young, and he's not going to make an impact anytime soon, but I like his fireballing ability out of the bullpen, and I think he could be fun to watch in the next couple of years. Well, I'll take you to a AAA game now and give you an idea of who exactly we have at that AAA level. You see some familiar names on that lineup, and we'll get into, into some of them As the game progresses, Forrest Whitley, the top Houston Astros prospect, was on the mound and not having the best year for the Sugarland Skeeters, an ERA over five. Here's one of the prospects that the Rangers have right now, Andy Abanez. If you're a Ranger fan in real life, you've seen him uh, make his Major League debut this season. And while he hasn't done that with us yet, he gets a base hit right back up the middle here in the first inning. I really like Abanez's swing. He's got a compact motion, good contact ratings as well. Whitley, though, flashing what makes him so tough, and it's his change in speed. He's got a upper 90s fastball, but he can also slow it down with a changeup. He's also got a really good slider. So there's two on and one out here in the first, and Whitley continues to work his way out of it. He strikes out uh, Jonathan Guzman, then he strikes out Davis Wenzel, and then with two outs, Yanio Perez hits this one on the screws, but right at the second baseman, and the Express wastes their chance in the first. It was Joe Palumbo on the mound for the Express, a 6-2 and two record with an ERA just below 3.5, and Palumbo, much like Colby Allard, is another lefty that I'm going to look to in the future to hopefully be a part of this organization. Palumbo's a slow worker that certainly profiles more as a starting pitcher, I think, rather than someone out of the bullpen like maybe what Allard could do but you see right there what makes him so dangerous he's got a fantastic repertoire can bring the fastball in on the hands but he can also work breaking pitches away from lefties and in to righties and he was extremely tough to hit here in the first he gets the first two outs via strikeouts we'll catch up with Palumbo in just a little bit Josh Stowers now in the top of the sixth it's the uh, express lead two to one and Stowers is going right back up the middle RBI single for Josh, one of the prospects that the Rangers got in return for the Rugnet Odor trade to the Yankees. And Stowers is having an okay season at AAA. I'm excited to see what he can do. Now, bottom of the sixth, and this is one of the strangest errors that I've seen in MLB The Show. That certain Apostle over at third base, who I will give you, is a large man to be playing third, but it really is his natural position. And give you another look at this. I This was completely all the game. Uh, they wouldn't let me move Apostle over to get in front of that ball. So Shurton may really need to work on the fielding if he wants a MLB career with us. But uh, Joe would get out of the inning. That error wouldn't cost him. And the Express would take a 3-1 lead to the 7th. I quick simulated the rest of the way because, to be honest, it was getting late and I was ready to go to bed. And uh, as you're going to see, nothing really happens the rest of the way. We end up taking Joe Palumbo out there in the 8th and put in Spencer Patton. Spencer would give up a couple of base hits, but in the end, nothing would ultimately come back to bite uh, the Express. And you'll see Joe Barlow go into the game to close this one out, and he'll do just that. He gives up a double to J.J. Machovic, but in the end, nothing hurts them, and the Express get the win. Palumbo gets his seventh win of the season, and he's a guy that I think you may see in a Ranger uniform relatively quickly towards the end of this season. He got the win for us. Whitley took the loss. The notables there, you looked at Andy Abanez. Uh, Jonah Heim had an RBI as well, and then, of course, Josh Stowers. Well, the rest of the month of July is going to be full of trade deadline talk and acquisitions. I've recorded that episode already. I'm excited for you guys to get to see what direction I end up taking this. Show you that the only Ranger prospect is Josh Young, listed in the top 50, but he continues to climb that list. So uh, we'll be looking to add more talent through the trade deadline. Would love to know your thoughts, who you think uh, should be dealt, who you think I should keep 
at the trade deadline, but the month of July is going to be busy. In the next episode, we'll simulate through the All-Star game and then ultimately up into the trade deadline. And by the end of next episode, you'll know exactly where the Rangers stand heading into the rest of 2021, as well as the future beyond. Well, that'll do it for episode eight of the Texas Rangers franchise rebuild here on the MSM Sports Network. Would love to know your thoughts and opinions on this episode. Would really appreciate it if you would drop a like or leave a comment. The feedback is always appreciated, and I would really like to know what you guys think about how I've managed this series so far and what you want to see in future episodes. I think there's a number of different ways that we can continue to go with this franchise and a lot of really interesting moves that we have, not only at the trade deadline, but going into that first offseason as well. Thank you guys so much for watching. Until next time, so long, everybody.